2015 Penn Hessel Tiltman Prize for History. I'm Catherine Taylor, Deputy Director of English Penn, and I'm delighted to welcome our winner this year, Jessie Child, for her book, God's Traitors, Terror and Faith in Elizabethan England, published by Bodley Head and in paperback by Vintage. The, the Penn Hessel Tiltman Prize is enabled by a bequest to English Penn from former member Marjorie Hessel Tiltman. And I'd like to thank this year's judges, David Horsepool, Ruth Skur, and Chair Tom Holland, who's here to talk with Jessie today. And I'd also like to uh, give um, hearty thanks to Sarah Hesketh, the prize's administrator. I'd like to hand over to Maureen Freely, our president of English Pen, who will present the check for £2,000 to Jessie for God's Traitors, winner of the 2015 Penn Hessel Tiltman Prize for History. Well, uh, in return, I'd like to thank Penn for asking me and Ruth and David to um, judge the Hessel Tiltman Prize this year and to thank them for sending us completely free um, an enormous quantity of really excellent history books. I'm, I'm happy to report that the standard of history writing in Britain is really first class and we have a particularly fine shortlist, so please do check that out. Um, but ultimately, we're here to talk about the book that we thought was the single best history title this year, which, as we all know, is Jesse's wonderful book, God's Traitors. Um, and the subtitle, Terror and Faith in Elizabethan England, doesn't really convey the degree to which, although this is a panoramic survey of faith and terror in Elizabethan England, it's also very much a family history, isn't it? We have mm. your family over there in the <laughs> corner, so it's entirely fitting. But <laughs> could you tell us about, um, first of all, how you um, came across the Vauxes, this Catholic family, and why you fixed on them as the sort of the paradigm for what you wanted to write about? Sure. Um, I'm, I'd like to also repeat thanks to English Pen, um, who do such incredible, important work, and it's, it's such an honor. And thank you to you, too. Tom um, and Ruth and David. Uh, it actually sort of, they both tie in because the subtitle Terror and Faith in Elizabethan England is, is really a bit of a steal from Antonia Fraser's book on the gunpowder plot, which was Terror and Faith in 1605. So with her permission, I, I slightly nabbed that. Um, and it was reading that book a long time ago that I first came across these two sisters, Eleanor Brooksby and Anne Vaux, who um, their code names were the widow and the virgin. And they stuck with me and I always thought I want to know more about them and then it came to sort of thinking of a second book and I thought I, I absolutely want to do the recusants as they were known it comes from the Latin recusara to refuse they refused to go to Protestant church services every week and they were fined because they didn't and uh, I, I went to a Church of England school so I'd never really grown up with this alternative narrative it was all about Gloriana and all that um, so I, I wanted to explore this and I, I, I looked at the Vauxes and I also realized very quickly that you can't just do it through one person because everything changes throughout Elizabeth I's very long reign. And if you look at the patriarch of the family, Lord Vaux, William Vaux, the third Lord Vaux, he was quite loyal in comparison to his children who become slightly radicalized really by the repression that they experienced. So I, I then thought a family. And, um, and so it all sort of came together. And then I found out that someone else had done it. But it was uh, in 1953, um, actually a brilliant book by a Dominican priest called uh, Godfrey Anstruther. And um, a lot has happened since then. But that was, that was, uh, it, was, it was a brilliant book with great scholarship. But there's been a lot of, not only historiographically, but also in terms of sources that have come to light since then. So I thought it was time. So, so what sources have come to light? Um, Quite a lot, but the most exciting for me was um, this Spanish noblewoman called Dona Luisa de Carvajal, and, and she came to London just before the gunpowder plot, and she was on a mission to be a martyr. I mean, she, she absolutely wanted to be martyred, and because she was protected by the Spanish embassy, she never, she never got her wish. But she wrote these letters um, out, you know, and they were smuggled out to Spain, and there were reports on what she very much regarded as the persecution of Catholics at the time. And she said, you know, she tells these wonderful stories. For me, it was exciting because um, it sort of fleshed out these characters. So, for example, with Anne Vaux, who was 
arrested after the gunpowder plot. She harbored the chief Jesuit priest, Henry Garnet, who was executed in the aftermath of the gunpowder plot. And um, she was arrested, she was tracked down, and she was in solitary confinement to the Tower of London. And um, she would say that, you know, most people are absolutely cowed by this, but, but not a bit of it from her. She went, well, of course I knew about the gunpowder plot. I'm a woman, and women know about everything, don't you know? Um, and, and she said, they said well, well, you know, of course Henry Garnet was the ringleader. You know, you keep telling me he's the greatest traitor in the world. He wouldn't have missed this plot. And then she thanked her, her guards for giving her board and lodging because she said no one else in London was putting her up at the moment. And they, in the end, they, sort of, they threw their arms up in the air, her guards, and they said, we absolutely do not know what to do with that woman. So, so this, this is all from Donna Louisa de Carvajal and her letters. And, and there are other things as well. I mean, there was, a, there was this wonderful book that was not discovered by me, uh, by Gerard Kilroy um, last century, but it's, it's a sort of two-volume, massive encyclopedia of Catholic writings. And it was hidden away uh, for centuries. And it was, it was sort of secreted by the Brudenell family in, in uh, Dean in Northamptonshire. And that contains incredible things, including a very harrowing tale of a, an exorcism that happened um, just before the Babington plot in 1586. And it, it was basically a 15-year-old girl. There were, there were more, but this is the story of this 15-year-old girl called Sarah Williams. And she was strapped to a chair in front of an audience and uh, she was forced to drink hallowed drinks, as they called them, basically oily stuff that made her sick. Um, she, had, uh, she was fumigated. She had brimstone burnt under her nose until they said her face was as black as a chimney sweep. And she had relics pressed against her flesh, including um, her private parts. And, and all this happened, and this is, you know, this is, a, this is a Catholic encyclopedia, and it's, it, they were writing about it because they were saying, isn't this great? The devil was expulsed from this girl. You know, she was dispossessed. This is the power of the priesthood. And, and you're reading it and you're thinking, this, this is frightful. And it, uh, it's one of those things that make, makes you realize, actually, you know, there are many parallels and echoes, but they're really not like us. You know? Well, you, you've talked about these two extraordinary women, but what's incredibly powerful about the book is that actually you show that um, the whole history of the family of the Vauxes, and you show that to begin with, they never had any desire at all to be radicals, to go against the government. Yep. Um, and the Vauxes begin as a sort of loyalist Tudor family, don't they? Yeah. Um, and the, the, the two women's father, was he Lord Vaux? Yes. I mean, he's a women. kind of Earl of Grantham figure. Yes. Sort of faintly yes. perplexed by the rapid changes that are going yeah. on. Yeah. And there is that sense that it's not the Vauxes who change, it's England who change. The England changes. Absolutely right. And the international situation, the excommunication by the Pope of Elizabeth I in 1570, which, which changes everything. And why is that? that? That is because from that point on, essentially, an Englishman can choose to be loyal to the Pope or to the Queen, but not both. Exactly, exactly. The Pope, Pope Pius V, excommunicated Elizabeth I on the 25th of February, 1570. And he said, not only is she a heretic, but uh, that she is a usurper. And he, he basically ordered the English Catholics to disobey her upon, upon pain of anathema, upon pain of them being excommunicated also. So in theory, they have this choice of two betrayals. You know, you can betray the Pope and condemn your souls to damnation forever, or you betray your queen, your country, and consign your bodies to all kinds of temporal punishments. And you know, they couldn't in good conscience do both. Actually, most of them did. You know, they would cross their fingers, they would fudge it, they would, they would go to church, but they would register their little protest. So you get, uh, you get someone called R Richard Scherben, who is my favorite. He, um, over two decades, he would put cotton wool in his ears every time he went to church. And that was his way of sort of saying, I'm not listening. But, but the attitude of the sort of the really hardcore Catholics yeah. who were out to become martyrs and to celebrate martyrs was that this was cheating. Absolutely, this was cheating. And they looked to Rome. So the Council of Trent in 1562 said, it's a sin. The Pope said, it's a sin. You cannot conform. You cannot go to church and cross your fingers. So the recusants, the refusers, the refuseniks didn't. And so in 1580, the law, they, they always, from the beginning of Elizabeth's reign, from the beginning of the Elizabethan settlement, it is by law, they have to go to Protestant church services every week and also you know their, their, their mass is banned but in 1580 the fine is raised to 20 pounds a month which is thousands of pounds in today's money so you, you get actually people like the Vauxes, noble families 
rebelling far more because they can afford, it, they can more. afford it. But you're absolutely right about Lord Vaux. I, mean, he's, 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 I think Simon Callow in, in The Guardian called him the Earl of Emsworth in a rough, <laughs> <laughs> which is quite right. He is. There's something Wood has seen about him. And, and he's, he's sort of, he loves his children and he loves hunting and hawking and gambling and he's a bit deaf and he's not good with money and you know, he's, he's very sort of bumbling, affable character. Everyone loved him. And he's you know, the most unlikely rebel. You Whereas The Widow and The Virgin is their very code well, name the suggest. The virgin, yeah. I mean, that's something else that seems sort of strikingly modern, really, is, is that the obsession that everyone has with brilliantly dramatic and me indeed melodramatic code names. Yeah. So that must be a gift for you. <laughs> it is. I mean, the widow, you have white widows, you have black yeah. widows now. Um, our folks actually was, you know, both of them, you had to be a bit careful with the parallels because they're not... Well, okay, let... <laughs> Because you said, you said that you borrowed the, the subtitle from Antonia yes. Fraser, Terror and Faith in Elizabethan England. Yeah. Now, I can't remember when she wrote the gunpowder plot, but it was... 90s, well, no, it was in the 90s, 90s, I think. Earlier, yeah. So things have changed, and so that phrase, um, Terror and Faith, would have a pretty different signification now. Sure. And of course, that lurks behind quite a lot of what you're writing. Yeah. To what extent was that an encouragement, the possible parallels with um, Islamic terrorism? Um, and to what extent did you feel, oh, I've got to guard against making easy yeah. parallels? It's really, really important. Um, not only because the sort of Catholic heritage and recusancy generally is, is something that is, is, is very carefully studied and, and protected as, as, as Catholic heritage. And you know, terrorism is a modern concept. And even the gunpowder plot was a few very, very, very you know, extreme radicals. The majority of the recusants, I believe, were you know, just trying to worship freely. And at the same time, they're trying to reconcile that with being faithful to their queen. So you get this sort of equivocation and this fudging that goes on. But I, but I do find, I think actually, of all the parallels, what I found most interesting, and I see it from both sides, I hope, is, is you know, the weighing up between security and liberty. Um, and uh, you know, Francis Walsingham said there is less danger in fearing too much than too little. Um, and he would stoke up these flames about a, a fifth column and the enemy within. And it sounds all very sort of Farage at the moment. But, but at the same time, you have, you have the other side where they're saying the state is the bogeyman and they are radicalizing everyone and it's terrible, terrible repression and they're torturing everyone. And, and uh, you know, the sort of sometimes there are shades of cage in what they're saying in the way that the, the, the state is entirely at fault, when quite clearly some recusants and some of the missionary priests were, were definitely involved in plots against Elizabeth I. And, and we mustn't forget that England was at war with Spain from 1585, and in 1588 you get the Spanish Armada, 130-odd ships coming up to invade England. I mean, imagine sort of the, you know, the black flag of ISIS coming towards us. It would be, it would be terrifying. Thomas Hobbes was born in, 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 in 1588, and, and his mother said that uh, she gave premature birth in because of the fear. And he always said that uh, he gave, uh, his mother gave birth to twins, himself and fear. So we, I think you know, it's, it's, we cannot underestimate the, the fear of, of a Catholic invasion. And you, know, you have all these things that happen, not only the burnings in the year, you know, the, the rain before, Bloody Mary is so called, um, when about 300 odd Protestants were burnt at the stake for being Protestant, for not being Catholic. But you also have these horrible, horrible atrocities going on on the continent in Europe, like the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day, which was in 1572. And, it was the sanctified slaughter of, of thousands of French Protestants, the Huguenots. Um, and the River Seine was said to run red with blood. And actually one of the most chilling things I, I read during my research very early on was, was a report from the Spanish ambassador um, to Philip II of Spain at the time. And he said, as I write, they are killing them all. They are dragging them through the streets. They are stripping them naked. They're sparing not even a babe. And as I'm reading it, I'm kind of expecting the, the official condemnation, and you don't get it. He carries on, and he says, Blessed be God who has converted the French princes to his cause. May he inspire their hearts to continue as they have begun. So, you know, this is God's work, and it is great. You know, this is what they're thinking. It's very apocalyptic, this mindset. In that sense, the sort of religious hatred, the religious enthusiasm, if we want to use the euphemism, is... is, is there's a, there's a strong echo there. Do you think, do you think that, that the fact that um, now, maybe more than 20 years ago, the general reading public has a better understanding of how religion can drive people to do things that by the standards of non-believing people 
doesn't seem extreme. Do you think that, that, that helped you with the writing of it? Yes and no. I mean, I, you, you cannot open a newspaper now without reading about some atrocity going on in Iraq or Syria. Or but also, Virginia I mean, people going off with the aim of being martyred. Absolutely. So that is something that, that, is something that, that a that few years ago would have seemed yes. incomprehensible. Yes, true. But, but at the same time, I still think it's very hard to get into the mindset when every single person pretty much in the 16th century believed in something. And, you know, the worst thing you could call someone was not a shit devil, like, like more called Martin Luther. It was to call them, sorry, children. <laughs> it was to call them an atheist, you know. Um, so I still think it's perplexing for us now. Yes. But, but yes, yes, you, you, you pick up the papers in, and, and, and the techniques are the same, you know, the sort of the burnings and the beheadings and the destruction of statues and books and civilizations. And, and I think and, that is... And, and, and you said that... Um, you felt um, that one of the great themes in this book is the tension between security and liberty. Yeah. Um, usually people who write about Catholics from the Catholic point of view are doing it from an avowedly apologetic sure. perspective. Yeah. Um, I, it, it seemed to me reading it that the, the balance of... Of, of sympathy and of understanding was very, very powerful on both sides, that, that you read it and you completely identify with what the Catholics are trying to do, their regret, their anger. But you do also very powerfully understand what's at stake for, for the Protestant establishment. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm glad. Um, I really worked hard to try and be sensitive and see it from, from every aspect. And of course, you can't generalize. You know, there aren't just extremists here and moderates there and the state here. There are all sorts of huge spectrum of opinions. Um, but I think it was very, very hard for the state to, to try. And, you know, you, you, you would get this kind of equivocation, which is sort of uh, sanctified lying in a way. Um, it was, you get these guidebooks, these handbooks, from Rome that would basically say, you can say this, but you can't say that, or you can say it like this, but you can't do that. Um, and I think, I think you, you know, you, you can see the state, you know, they, they tried to reconcile it. They would ask what they called the bloody question. And it was, if um, a Catholic army invades England under the Pope's orders, would you support your queen or would you support your Pope? And, you know, they would end up fudging it always. So they would say, well, you know, it, it, God will tell me what is right at the time, or, you know, it depends on the circumstances of the moment and things like that. And so you can see the state, you know, try, and it, they didn't persecute every single Catholic. Some were treated to a, a certain amount of lenience, although not tolerance. But there are some who are consciously trying to trap Catholics, aren't there? Absolutely, yes. And you get, I mean, you get again with the, sort of the priest hunters, the Percivants, they're known as. You get some, you get, you get an out and out rotter called Richard Topcliffe, who is a sort of a rapist and a torturer and a sadist, and he absolutely loved chasing priests. But then you get all these other uh, perseverants who are really just local JPs and local officials, and they are sent to these Catholic homes to, you know, tear them down, to pull out the priests, knowing that if they are caught, they will be hand drawn and quartered. And, and there's a squeamishness in them. And I think a lot of the time, you know, they, sometimes they're bribed not to see priests. But other times, I think they sort of might but, look the other way a little but, bit. But often there's also a, a sort of incredibly English embarrassment about it, yes. where the Protestant neighbour of the Catholic Lord has to go round. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, yes. old chap, but do you have any priests hidden here? <laughs> exactly, exactly right. And, and uh, that's why women were so effective at being priest harbourers, because there was, this, there was this absolute squeamishness, especially at invading a domestic sphere, if it's, if it's widows or spinsters, even more so. And you see them taking advantage. So there's, there's one great story with... Um, Eleanor Brooksby, the, 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 the virgin of the widow and the virgin, her adopted daughter, um, Frances Burroughs, 11 years old at the time, and the priest bang on the door, and, and, and she is there with Eleanor, and she gets up, and she says, you know, how dare you barge in like this? You know, my mother will die if she sees a naked blade. And you see Eleanor behind going, oh, oh, oh. And so they do, they stand there and they're like, terribly sorry, terribly sorry. And off scuttles Francis to go and get some uh, restorative drinks for her swooning mother. And of course, what she's doing is hiding priests, hiding vestments, hiding relics, hiding the massing equipment. So they would take advantage of the squeamishness sometimes. Well, one thing that's also very striking is how incredible um, the writing is from this period. 
Mm. Um, and it's a slight problem that the Catholics tend to write in Latin. <laughs> but when they wrote in English, they wrote really, really powerfully. So I wonder, do you think that Penn would have... Um, would, they have, would, would Penn have taken up the cause of these recusants? It's a very good question. I think we'll have to ask <laughs> You don't have that. to ask. <laughs> um, it depends which ones. I mean, one, one source that was irresistible for me was um, John Gerard's autobiography. And he, did, he wrote in Latin, and the English translation isn't, isn't half as good. And my Latin, I'm not as good at tr as translating, so I use that translation. But it was, it was uh, I think, Evelyn Moore likened him to Buchan. And uh, his publishers, Longmans, likened him to Dumas. And he is it's very swashbuckly. And he's, he's, this, he's this great character. And, and he's, it, it, there's one story that you, know, you, you couldn't make it up. He escapes from the Tower of London. Um, and he does so six months after being tortured, being hung from the manacles. And he does it by means of an orange. And how he does it is he bribes his warder into giving him an orange. I like oranges. OK. Uh, and then he cuts the peel into little crosses and threads them into rosaries. And he bribes his warder a little bit more. And he says, you know, can you give these guys this, this to my friends on the outside? And it's just my way of saying, I'm all right. I'm keeping the faith. And the warder thinks, OK. But actually, orange juice is a very good invisible ink. And on the wrapping paper, the blank wrapping paper that these rosaries were wrapped in, were secret messages. And basically, he, you know, he said, come and get me. Row up in your boat and come and get me with a rope. And that's what they did. And they, you know, they attached the rope to uh, where his tower in the Tower of London. And one entered the wharf. And he, he managed to make his way across. And the best thing about this for me is you know, I've, got, I've got a six-year-old and a three-year-old over there. And um, one weekend. We practiced you know, with, with orange juice as Invisible Ink, and it, and it absolutely works. And it's, it's pretty much the only time, pro probably in the future as well, that, that historical research and childcare come together. You know? Well, I have to say that, that, that Jessie's enthusiasm and passion is absolutely what made us give her the prize for this. Um, I, I w I've got lots more questions to ask, but I think it's fair that um, I open it to the floor. If any of you have questions for Jessie, oh, please ask away. Anyone? Yes, Susie. Oop. Thanks, that's a great talk so far. Um, Jesse, what was, where was Elizabeth in all this? Uh, do you go into what her views actually were? I mean, to what extent were people, um, you know, not necessarily acting on her orders? What, what were her views? Yeah, that's good. She's, she's always credited Elizabeth I with having you know, the heart and stomach of a king. But uh, one, one Catholic woman who uh, was arrested for harboring a priest said if she just had the bowels of a woman, she wouldn't allow this suffering to happen. But actually, you know, I, I don't go into her all that much, but it, it's very important to, to say that she was, I think, you know, by nature, a moderate. Um, it doesn't mean that she wasn't a committed Protestant, but she didn't go in for, you know, the, the extremist, fanatical type faith that her sister Mary had. And uh, you know, some, people always say that she didn't seek to make windows into men's souls, which is actually a misquote. France, France Bacon said it, and it was hearts and secret thoughts, which is possibly a different thing. But she did act as a curb on people like Francis Walsingham um, and Lord Burley. And she did, sometimes there were, there were quite extremist bills put forward in Parliament, like enforced communion. You know, the Catholics were forced to go to Protestant church services, but not to take communion every week. And uh, she, she vetoed that bill. And there were others like that. There was one to sort of forcibly take Catholic children from their households. So I think, you know, she was in the end put in this in terrible position. And as the reign goes on, I mean, in the 1580s, it's almost like a continuum of plots against her. And you do see a sort of flash of, of her sort of ruthlessness. You know, she is her father's daughter. After the uh, Babington plot of 1586, when, when these gentlemen, some of them of the court, uh, conspired to have her assassinated. It was the one that, that did it for Mary, Queen of Scots in the end. She was executed for that. And uh, Elizabeth did say, you know, she said to uh, Christopher Hatton, the minister, you know, is there any kind of uh, punishment that they could have that would be worse than hanging, drawing, and quartering? You know, I want, I want them to have the maximum pain. And he said he couldn't think of one. <laughs> so, but he did guarantee that they would hang and they, they, would, they, would, they would be cut down while still alive so that they would be very conscious of their evisceration. 
So she's not all lovely Gloriana, you know, she's, she's a tough lady. At the same time, she was in an impossible position, I think. And it's just that awful escalation that happens. Her godson, uh, Sir John Harrington, her saucy godson, he called himself, um, sort of says what comes first, the chicken or the egg. You know, is, is, is it all the plots or is it the repressive laws in Parliament? And uh, it, but he says, thus in the end, acts of religion have come to be treason. And that's how it was. Any other questions? Well, I'd, I'd like to follow up on that um, and ask you about Mary, Queen of Scots and how on earth it was that the Vorks is... I mean, how did they survive? They were clearly embroiled in that, weren't they? Well, yeah, it's really interesting. The Babington plot. Uh, Henry Vorks, who is Lord Vorks's son, he was a poet and he gave everything up to uh, work for the English mission, so to, to, to reconvert the country to Catholicism. And he, uh, he was basically the fund manager for the mission and he knew all the intelligence. He knew which priests were coming off, which boats when, what to call them, what their safe houses should be, you know, where they go and all that. Um, he was great friends with Anthony Babington. I mean, it says so in, in numerous state letters and correspondence. Um, and we know that Babington was also in the Vaux house of Hackney, uh, not long before the plot, and various things like that. And actually, I, I, it didn't go in the book because it was just a mess. But I did a spider diagram, you know, in the same way that the services do now, just trying to work out all the communications and the connections. And the Vaux is, a, you know, they're on the fringe, but it's very, very thick. And it, it, it's, again, it's sort of to go back to sympathy for the state sometimes, I couldn't quite pin it on them. I didn't have that killer bit of evidence, but, but they were, you know, they were on the fringes, let's just say that. Okay, one last question. Um, there is a sense of tragedy here. I mean, if you define tragedy as two sides that are right, being unable to get on with each other, that's very much what you have. And I wondered, um, there's a lot of debate about what Shakespeare's religious affiliations, if any, might have been. Yeah. And I wondered if the experience of researching and writing this book um, gave you any thoughts or insights on, onto the nature, first, of Shakespeare's religious affiliations, and secondly, what kind of influence this climate of fear might have had on the phenomenon of um, the English literary golden age at the late Tudor and early Jacobean period? Wow, okay. Well, Shakespeare's faith, first of all, I think, first off, I don't think you should ever look for biography in his works because you could argue either way. I mean, you really can. He's sort of, in Macbeth, he's very much, you know, the, there's, there's the porter asked the farmer. Farmer was uh, one of the code names for Henry Garnet, the Jesuit executed in the gunpowder plot. He says, faith is an equivocator who could weigh in both the scales against either scale, who could commit treason enough for God's sake, but could not equivocate to heaven. So that's very unsympathetic. And then you have other things, maybe in in Lear uh, with Edgar when he's possessed by, you know, when, when he calls himself poor Tom and he's possessed and, and he is possessed by demons and flippity gibbets. And that is very much his drawing on the exorcisms. And yet there's a sort of, there's a debate about this as there always is with Shakespeare, but, but the sense that maybe Edgar is like the persecuted Catholic priests and he has to assume an alter ego and pretend to be possessed. Um, in order to escape the persecuting state. So, you know, you can read Shakespeare a million different ways. And, and of course, you know, in his poetry as well, the, 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 uh, the bare-ruined choirs where, where late the sweet birds sang and could be about William Byrd, or it could not be. Um, so, so Shakespeare, I don't, I don't touch. <laughs> On the other hand, his father, uh, John Shakespeare, was a recusant. Uh, he, it's in there in the Warwickshire recusant rules. Um, and he said he didn't go to church because he was in debt. And that's a common excuse at the time because you can't take communion if you're out of charity with your neighbors if you're in debt with your neighbors. So again, you know, he was probably a Catholic recusant, but we can't, you know, and there's also a testament of his that was found in a house, I mean, remarkably, uh, that sort of suggests that he was indeed, you know, very much a Catholic recusant. And by the way, that's one of the most exciting things about this is the discovery. Um, not mine, sort of the, the most exciting one was in 1828 builders knocking through a wall in Rushton Hall in Northamptonshire and a book comes down. So they knock through a bit more and then they find all these papers, the papers of Thomas Tresham. Um, and again, you, 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 you priest holes, there was a swinging beam hide at Harvington Hall that was only discovered in 1894 by a little boy exploring what was then a derelict wing. So there might be more. So there might be more. Waiting I mean, to be found. It, 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 
still happening. I was really hoping when the book came out that there might be a discovery. <laughs> That'd be good publicity. Um, but in terms of literature as a whole, I mean, I think it was one of the very interesting things is sort of the propaganda on both sides um, and who wins in a way. And I think the Catholics are winning. And you have people like Robert, Robert Southall, the poet, who, who writes beautiful, and Henry Walpole as well. Why do I use my paper ink and pen? You know, they write these incredible poems. Uh, Chidiot Tichborn as well, just on the eve of being executed for the Babington plot. Uh, and, and Young I, Vaux as well. Yes, Henry Vaux as well, indeed, and, 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 and many others, and Ben Johnson, of course, as, as going forward. I think sort of persecution literature is always better than triumphalism literature, in a way. Well, and that's an emphatically pen note on which to end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jesse. It's a great book. Do read it. Thank you.